today I'd like to take your attention to the book of Acts. The book of Acts chapter 3. I will read from verse 6 to verse 8. And I'm reading from the King James Version of the scripture. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple walking and leaping and praising God walking and leaping and praising God and I want to speak briefly as a subject matter the lame man at the gate the lame man at the gate according to the new testament of scripture there was a gate called beautiful the beautiful gate was one of the gates belonging to the temple in jerusalem this is prior to the destruction of the same by the romans in a.d 70 and it is the same gate that is referred to in the account that we are about to derive our lesson from. The Bible speaks about this gate as a place of access. It would have been the major gate that people would use as they come into the temple, sometimes to pray at the prayer hour, another times to listen to the rabbi reading ever so carefully from the Torah. There was always an understanding that it portrayed their value and the placement of the importance of God in their mindset and in the conduct of their lives. It is this same gate that is called the beautiful gate that there was a man that was lame that was laid at this gate. The Bible says they took him and they laid him at this gate daily. He was laid there to ask alms. In other words, when we're thinking about alms, it's not necessarily money. When you look at that word alms, the interpretation seems to suggest that he was asking for compassionateness. He's asking for pity. He's asking for mercy. And if his condition can touch the, the, the heart of the person passing by, then perhaps he can give, donate, or support him, whether in money or any other thing that he believes can assist his need. According to the scripture, his intention was to reach those that were going into the temple. And it is very important because in the preceding verses and encapsulating the whole story, you notice that he does not particularly focus on those coming out of the temple. But the scripture speaks about those going into the temple. Now, what makes him expect from those going into the temple? I would dare to suggest that perhaps those going into the temple are already coming with who they are. And they're not coming out to give to him because the rabbi said so. And likewise, it could well be that those going into the temple still have all their offerings. And they have not yet emptied their pocket in the offering basket. But for whatsoever the other reasons may be, 
his focus was on those going in to the temple. Notice how it is that whatsoever he derived did not address his lameness. In fact, by virtue of the story that we see, he seemed to have accepted his lameness. And it is the consequence of the lameness that he is trying to solve now. He had accepted his lameness perhaps because the Bible says he was born lame. So he never knew himself any other way than being lame. So like some people say, you just have to live with it. They put him there daily. Notice that while he is there at the gate of this temple, they never took him inside. If the inside of the temple will perhaps be typified by the inside of a modern church, there are three cardinal things that would happen. One of them will be praise, the other one will be the reading or the preaching of the word, and the third one will be prayers. He heard it, but he was never taken inside. And then on this particular day, the Bible says that Peter and John were coming into the temple in the hour of prayer. When they were passing into the temple, there is no indication in the scripture that that was the first time they came. So it could be well obvious that they already knew him, they also had settled with the fact that he is there for a different reason than those who are there to go inside. He was there because he wanted to derive something to meet his need and sustenance. And he figured, there I stand a better chance of meeting people who have a heart to show mercy, to show compassion, and to have pity on me. Peter and John, they said silver and gold we don't have. But whatsoever I have, I may not have what you're looking for, but I'm going to give you what I have. And what did they have? They had Jesus. They said in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. We will get to the miracle in a moment. You notice that rather than apologize, become depressed or whine about what they didn't have, they use what they had. As in Exodus chapter 4 verse 2, when God is speaking to Moses, he says, And the Lord said unto him, What is in thine hand? And he said, A rod. It was that same rod that God used to discipline Pharaoh. It was that same rod that God used to divide the Red Sea. Moses did not know the value of what looks small in his hand. May I suggest to you that what you do have may be bigger than what you are wanting for. And oftentimes it's the same way in life. They discovered, the disciples, that because they used what they had, they gave him what he needed. According to the scripture, he was healed. His heart was in the right place. He never thanked them and ran back out to join his friends. He went into the temple with them. There are some key points that we need to understand in this particular incident. When the man was sitting there, point number one, he looked to the disciples expecting what he normally receives, which is arms, favor, some little money. Secondly, they couldn't meet his normal expectations, but they met his cardinal need. 
Thirdly, what they did not have, talking about the disciples, could not prevent them. And it could not prevent what they did have. In fact, what they had was greater than what they did not have. Fourthly, rather than apologize and become depressed, they deployed again what they did have. There are few lessons in this particular account in our short message today. The first lesson from this short account is that what man needs in himself is often greater and deeper than what he needs for himself. Notice the man's physical lameness typifying the spiritual lameness of the human race due to sin and in need of restoration. Many people do not believe they need restoration and forgiveness from sin. They are drawn by their immediate physical needs and when they get down on their knees to pray, they don't pray for closer relationship with God. They pray for God to supply according to their list and to tick the boxes. According to the scripture, we need God more than what God has. But when man receives God's benefit, he should inquire and desire to know more about the God who provides that benefit. When you walk in the spirit, you are able to differentiate between what you want and what you actually need. Because no matter how much of what you want you get, it will not fulfill what you need. What is the difference? The difference is that what you have on the outside cannot substitute for what you don't have on the inside. Secondly, your starting point in life is not often as critical as where and how you finish. The journey in between simply connects the known and the expected. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 8. The writer says this, Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Many people don't have faith for eternal life. They have faith for position. They have faith for wealth. They have faith for everything else. But when Paul speaks about this, he is introducing what should be the correct destination of your faith. He says, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and have professed a good profession before many witnesses. Which means the journey of faith does not end in where you receive physical benefits. If it ends there, then your faith was like a lottery. It didn't extend into what it should be. The third lesson that we see in the account of this man, there are many things that are not where they should be in our lives and we just simply adjust. Adaptation is not an enemy if it does not impede the ability and the power and the superiority of God in terms of what he can do. When I look in the book of Isaiah chapter 55, if you see that I'm reading from verse 8, this is where God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Ephesians chapter 3. It speaks also the continuity of the superiority of God. He says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that walketh in us. Unto him 
be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. And then it ends with the word Amen. What is the point? God's ability exceeds your ability. Number four. Our expectations often fall short of what God offers us. We are more readily familiar with what we want than what we need. That is how we also frame our prayers. I would submit to you that it is imperative to focus your life more on the owner of all things rather than all that he owns. It is a fact in Psalm 24 and verse 1 that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. In Matthew 6, 33, it says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That refers to us. Make a differentiation between what you want and what you need. For God will always supply our need. The same cannot be guaranteed for our greed. Number five. God is sovereign. You see, if that man had been laying down there in that condition for many days. They brought him daily. The question then is, why wasn't he healed the first day? Was God late? The answer to that is no. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 1. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. No matter what you receive or possess in life, it cannot exceed the sovereignty of God. Respecting the sovereignty of God is very critical and very essential. This is how the man can understand why all the days he was laying there, nothing happened. I don't know how many of you have had expectations before that just did not happen the time that you expected. Number six, be willing to give as well as receive support in life. Remember that man that the disciples had spoken to. He was lame. The Bible says when they pulled him up, his knees and an, an ankle received strength. Notice what the disciples did not do. They didn't say, brother, we've prayed now. The rest is up to God. They didn't walk away. So I can imagine Peter and John, by the grace of God, they understood that man needs support. He needs support. The Bible speaks about one who sees a brother or a sister naked. And he has the clothes. He has the capacity to help. But instead of doing that, he prays over the sister. He says, go, be ye warm and filled. That has the ability to help, but does not help. Simply prays for him to find help elsewhere. Be willing to give help as well as receive help or support. What about the man? The man did not say things like, Well, uh, brothers, you finish praying. Let God do it, not you. You finish your part. You can go now. I, I, I don't need man's help. I need God's help. He will send his angels to complete the rest. I don't want you to say later on in the pulpit that God used you to help me. Uh -uh -uh. I've had enough of you pastors. You want something to preach about me on your pulpit. 
Go now. Amen. Amen. Let's clap for Pastor and let him go home now. It would have been a form of concealed pride. People that are stuck in their ways and would refuse help to be unstuck. They become so scared that the person helping them is going to become popular. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 17, he says, iron sharpeneth iron. So a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Lastly, number seven. Be a living testimony to God's glory. Notice in Acts chapter 3, verse 9 and verse 10. He says, and all the people saw him walking and praising God. He never got quiet. There are many things that God has done for you that you have not praised God for. You know, sometimes when we open our mouth, we advertise the God of the past, not the one of the present. We don't talk about what he has done for us. Consequently, when people hear about the God that we preach, they take him as the God of the past, of those good old days. Oh, I, was, I wish I was around in the days of Noah. Those are the days when God was active. I wish I was around when Moses was around. Those are the days when the power of God was so prevalent that each and every day, even if there was nothing else for you to speak well about God, if you roll and roll and roll and find yourself in the morning and you're able to take a deep breath and breathe out, that is enough reason. You know why? Many people did not do that. And you're telling me there's nothing to praise him for? You're telling me there is nothing that you have to say about God? Do you know simply because that man didn't run away? He stayed there. He praised God. He was so excited about what God has done. Do you know that he empowered the message that the disciples preached, the apostles preached that day? How much of your testimony can become a message to another person. Do not underestimate your testimony. What about you today? This man was laying at the gate of the temple called Beautiful. He was paralyzed. Whether you listening to me here right now or you hearing this word on a social media platform let me remind you that you may be paralyzed in a certain gate today may not be the same gate for you it could be the gate of destiny it could be the gate of spiritual restoration and refreshing it could be the gate of transformation. You may be paralyzed as you're at your gate of breakthrough. It could be the gate of healing. You're almost there, but not quite there. You could almost feel the breakthrough, but it didn't happen. You could be at the gate of prosperity, just very close, but not quite. You may be at the gate of good success and all-round success. You may be at the gate of divine promotion in your life. And sometimes you can just feel that you are at the gate of something. But it didn't quite happen. Because remember the man? They left him by the gate. They never took him in. There is no record that they took that man in. It is that man that receives strength to walk in by himself. They didn't take him in. But if you're sitting at a gate, if you're laying at the gate, if you're paralyzed at the gate, there must be a power 
to bring that breakthrough. Because obviously most human beings are not very good in assisting people through the gates. They want to pull them down instead so they can practice nepotism. I'll jump in the gate and I'll pull my uncle and my auntie too. You, you don't even speak our language. You better find one of yours to put you through the gate. But when I read about the person that can take me and you past that gate, it's horrible to be paralyzed right next to where help can be found. And you feel like you can just stretch yourself and say, can you not see a part of me on the other side? Yet the power to do it is not there. You need someone that masters the gates of life. Someone that can give strength. Much more than that. You need someone that can come inside you and walk with you through those gates. You need Jesus Christ. That is who you need. That is who the lame man at the gate needed. They've been giving him what he wanted for so long. But there was a day he was going to get what he needed. He needed strength. He needed restoration. He needed healing. In fact, he needed something that he has never had his entire life. He needed to be the way God intended for him to be, which he never knew. He needed Jesus Christ. When I look at Psalms 24, from verse 7, the psalmist says this, he says, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? And he ends that chapter this way. He says, the Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. May every gate in your life that has sustained your paralysis be lifted up right now. May the Lord who is mighty in battle, the Lord of hosts, come inside of you by his Holy Spirit and conquer the things that paralyze you at the gate. May he come inside you and the things that you have never seen or witnessed in your life, the things that look impossible, the things that you are almost there but not there, I say in the name of Jesus that you are there, you are there, you are there in Jesus' name. It is not by power or by might. You are not made to be paralyzed at a gate. You are made to walk through that gate. And I say in the name of Jesus, you will conquer every obstructing gate in your life. In the name of Jesus, the gates of hell will not prevail against you. In the name of Jesus, you will not be a bystander when others are blessed. In the name of Jesus, you will not be a, an onlooker to people that are possessing their gates of destiny, spiritual restoration, refreshing, breakthroughs, transformation, healing, prosperity, and the gates of all-round success and divine promotion. 
you will never be paralyzed you will possess your possessions you will inherit your inheritance the lord will be glorified the gates must be lifted the gates shall never be limitations they shall just be a welcoming doorway to god's ordained purpose in your life in the name of jesus father we thank you could you stand